this is, this is, this is. Welcome back to it, another episode of the Mike Herrera Podcast. I'm your host, that's right, Mike Herrera. Good to be here. It is May 27th and beyond 2024. We are saying goodbye to the spring. We're heading into summer. Summer's coming, whether you like it or not. Uh, It's going to be some wild nights ahead. Speaking of wild nights, the other night, just last night, in fact, I, I was just about to go to bed. I was going in from a phone call. I heard a ruckus and I was like, what is that? It was on my deck and I went out on my deck and then all of a sudden I heard a crash and these two raccoons were in a ball just wrestling and rolling around fighting, making these weird animal noises and it was like WWE or WWF, depending on when you grew up and what you, <laughs> what sc- school you came from, uh, but body slams, uh, choke holds, suplexes—they were doing everything, biting each other, like. Arr! And I'm sitting there just filming. I'm like, I was filming from afar. Like at first, I was like startled and 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 I got my heart rate going. I'm like, well, I'm never gonna get to sleep now, but. <laughs> I got I, I I got a little close, but I I didn't want to mess with their thing because I, I I it was so cute what they were doing. They're just like fighting each other, but kind of a play fight. And then I was like, wait, are they mating? Are they? Is one guy trying to like get it, and the the other the other gir- girls like no, bro, and is like running from because they were just like chasing each other and jumping on each other. It was just so wild. It was. It was like nothing I've really seen before. I felt like I was catching a glimpse of the animal kingdom that I that you know you normally wouldn't see, right? So it was my little wild night last night. Uh, it was like it was like twelve thirty at night, something like that. So we'll pass midnight, and um, I think the animals were just getting getting started for it. So anyway, let's get to your voicemails before we do that. If you want to be part of the show. Please call in. Would love uh, both ladies and gentlemen to call in. Um, it helps if you know what you're going to say, but you can do it off the cuff too. Uh, what I'd love to get from you guys as as listeners and sometimes as participants is, you know, when when you have a story that's very interesting, please give us more details on it. Like we had a, a call last week that I was like, man, I, I wish I knew more about what you're doing. Cause it was a guy that called in um, about having gone to Afghanistan and was listening to MXPX before he he uh, was in Afghanistan. And then in Afghanistan, I don't know if he was listening or not, but I, I can't remember. But my point is, is I wanted to know so much more. So um, call back in. Tell us what's up. Tell us more about your tour of duty in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and you know, intertwine some MXPX in there if you, if you feel like it. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to say, people, is call in. The number is 360-830-6660. Call in. Leave a voicemail. It could be a topic. Uh, would love to hear, you know, about the first time you ever saw MXPX, about the first time you ever saw a show period, any kind of show. Uh, do you still go to shows today? Uh, I know these are not great questions to be honest, but I, I, I just want to, I want to get the conversation started, you know, and if you guys have good topic ideas, call in, you don't have to leave a long voicemail. You can be like, Hey, could you talk about this? Thanks. Bye. That would be cool. Um, because otherwise, you guys are just going to get my stories about raccoons fighting slash making love. I can't, you know, I don't make the rules. I just follow them. All right, here we go. Here's the first voicemail. Hey, Mike, it's uh, Dane's calling from Eastern Canada. Um, I was watching Scooby-Doo with my kid the other day. Uh, I've got this app or whatever, and there's about a thousand different Scooby-Doo movies and shows or whatever. And uh, all of a sudden, um, we're watching this show, and uh, a bunch of your tunes show up. Um, do 
human time and uh, Christ, I can't remember the other song that came, but whatever. Um, I'm just kind of curious, uh, what other movies and shows have uh, MXPX been on? Anyway, new record's great. Have a good one. Cheers. Dude, thanks for calling. Um, great question. And we actually, I kind of covered this a couple episodes ago, but I won't make you go back. I'll just try to remember what I said. We've been on a lot of shows. Our music has been on a lot of shows. Um, Scooby-Doo, uh, whichever one that is. <laughs> I think it's the, 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 yeah, I don't know which one it is, but we're on one of the Scooby-Doo's and we're on um harold and kumar go to white castle um the chick magnet we're on um a bunch of shows like uh, new york minute um something about luck with Lindsay lohan it's just a uh, you know whether whether it's a song or you know a poster in the background like we were on um uh the it was it was Dwayne the Rock Johnson in something about the Tooth Fairy or something like that. Anyway, uh, there's just like a there's got to be a list somewhere. I think Chris Barch might have uh, a website called like the MXPX Archives or something like that. Um, anyway, there's a bunch, but one of the most notable would be when we were actually in a movie. We we're in Wuthering Heights. Uh, the year was, I want to say 2000, 2003, 2003, more like somewhere in there. Uh, we, we were playing live. Catherine Heigl's character is giving me the googly eyes. I'm giving her the googly eyes. We ended up hanging out after the show. And then it kind of like ends on the scene where I'm like going into her car. Or is it my car? I don't. I think it's her car. I don't really know. <laughs> the script didn't really mention that part. Anyway, uh, that was fun. Um, there's been so many things. There's been a bunch more movies. I honestly just can't remember them, or I haven't even seen them all. But you know, you hear about them now and again. Um, video games. We're on a ton of those as well. A lot of sports games. Um, the Sims is one of my favorite ones. The Sims, I don't know which Sims it is, but we're on one of the Sims. It's obviously not the first or second Sims, but it's one around when we put out before everything and after. So 2004, 2003, somewhere in there. And uh, you play, I, I, I actually rewrote the lyrics for Late Again, and it's called Shanga Day. And I sing... Shang a day, forgive me, fray for I uh, shang something like that. But it was like the words were real. Like I, I, I didn't just sing gibberish. Like because when I repeated those parts, I would sing those parts again, and they resembled what the words were, but they just were in similes. I, I watched some videos on sim language. I, I kind of just did my best, but also really took it seriously my wife helped out um i i gave her you know I, I would like bounce my ideas off of her and be like does this sound like sim simulese or similes or <laughs> and it worked out it was great so shanga day shanga day is the the new version of not today kind of a little tangent from your movie question but that's that's what it is all right let's hear the next one Hey, Mike, it's Jordan from West Virginia calling in again. Hey, I was just listening to uh, a face-to-face -face record, and they have a song uh, it's called Three Chords and a Half-Truth. I think it came out in 2012, 2013. Anyway, it sounds almost exactly like the same chord progression and vocal arrangement as uh, MXPX song, My Life Story. So I wonder how that came about or how you feel about a song that you wrote 12 or 13 years prior influencing a band like face to face or maybe the chord progression and stuff is just simple and it just fits for lots of different things i don't know but i was just cruising and listening to that and it just hit me and i wanted to see what you thought see ya 
Jordan, I don't know, I don't remember that song, but let's, I can't play much of it or else I'll get, get thrown out, but let's try it. Let's, let's check it out. Okay. All right, all right. I get it. Yeah, it's got some similarities, but I don't think it's uh Yeah, I don't think it's on purpose, honestly. Like, you know, it's um you know, people accidentally they accidentally rip off little parts of songs, you know, and he probably Trevor I mean, no doubt Trevor's heard that song, but dun, 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 dun. Yeah, he, he you know, it happens. It happens. I don't think he I don't personally think he ripped us off, but maybe, maybe he heard it. But, um, hey, we've all done it. Accidentally, if anything, you know. Um, that, that's the thing, is you, do, you don't do it on purpose necessarily, but you, it's still possible to do it. All right, let's see what's next. What's up, Mike? It's Joe again from St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, just listen to the New Music Monday. I also wanted to share about the show in Orlando. I met you there, and um, I did forget to say what's up to uh, Tom, Chris, and Yuri, so I just wanted to give them a shout-out, say how awesome they did as well. And um, anyways, it was cool to meet you guys. It was cool to be at the show and uh, get an autograph and a picture and... Uh, show you my tattoo and um of the Darth Vader PXPX so I just wanted to share about the show and uh hearing the new songs live you know it was really awesome and um I got to meet a lot of really awesome people it is like a community and it is pretty awesome I guess that's about it for today dude thanks for the call Joe um yeah Florida was awesome meet and greet thank you I remember seeing your tattoo the Darth Vader PX. That is <laughs> such a fun design. I remember when we came out with that, I was just like, dude, that's awesome. And then seeing you getting tattooed, it looks great on the, on the arm there. Anybody. So shout out to anybody that's got an MXPX themed tattoo of any kind. Uh, I commend you. I, I was the first, um, only because I hoarded the artwork and got it done before it was public. But, uh, you know, I, it, it's wild to think that people have tattoos of my band on their arm. And it's been a thing for a while. I don't take it lightly. Uh, it kind of blows my mind. So thank you. Solidarity. What's up? How did it, did it hurt? Did it hurt? What's the, what's the worst place you guys have been tattooed? That's what I want to know. So if somebody called in and asked me that, I would say the worst place is... It's a combination. There's a couple worse places. There's elbow. Some people don't mind the elbow, though. I hate it. It's terrible. The knee. The knee was one of my worst. Kneecap. Boom. The, the knuckle of your ankle, like on your foot, but the knuckle, like, you know, where it sticks out on your foot, on your ankle. Ah! <laughs> get tattooed right there i don't think i've gotten tattooed exactly right there but pretty close that's got to be the worst um your sternum right in the middle here is not fun your back on your spine on your back not fun your sides and your armpits i haven't gotten my actual armpit tattooed but a buddy of mine has a bunch of buddies of mine have and there's just they're like, that's the worst. It is the worst. Imagine having the tattoo scab on your armpit while you're just like sweating and trying to sleep. Oh, hey, the fun we do, the fun we have trying to heal these tattoos. So I haven't gotten tattooed in a little while. I feel like I feel like I should, I, I, I don't know. I feel like the itch again, like I need to get something. But at the same time, putting all my money into this studio, we have, we have, you know, totally redone all of the the electronics in the patch bay and, you know, gotten new racks for all the gear upstairs. A lot has changed down here. You're going to see it's, it's a little different. I feel like I'm in a raft in the middle of the ocean sometimes um, 
with cell, cell phone service, of course. <laughs> All right, let's move on. What's up, Mike? My name's Keith. I live in Florida. Um, just wanted to call and say, first of all, thank you so much for the songs for all the years. And um, I've been listening since life in general. Um, huge fan in youth group. Me and my buddies used to cover all your guys' songs, and and that's kind of how I started learning how to play guitar. And it's been uh, such a a fun experience being fans of you guys. Um, every record kind of feels like I've been growing up together because I think when you're a little older than than me, but I think like whatever you're going through and you write the songs by the time they're recorded and the albums released, and I'm hearing them. It's like I'm going through a lot of the same stuff in my life. Um, that's been really evident the last couple records. I think there's a maturity in your songwriting that's uh, some of the best stuff that, that I think you guys have ever put out. And being a parent and um, being grown up now, I can relate to so much of, of all of that. So, yeah, I mean, MXPX has just been kind of part of the, the fabric of my life and, and growing up and it's been a blast and it's been some of my best memories um that that i can recall and speaking of best memories we just went and saw you in orlando brought my four-year-old daughter to the show it was her first show and we were, my wife and i were a little nervous um didn't know how she was going to do uh, but she loves your songs. She sings along to a bunch of them. Her favorite is punk rock show. She started fading a little bit in the middle of the set because it was way past her bedtime. But she hung in there. And um, during punk rock show, she sang her head off. She loves Not Today, Responsibility, Chick Magnet, Let's Ride, all that stuff. But she crushed it during punk rock show. Everybody around us was, like, taking video of her and they loved it. She was like the star of the show. So never had a chance to talk to you in person or say thank you, but thanks for all the memories. Thank you for my new favorite memory of ever going to a show, singing those songs with my little girl. Um, it meant everything to me. So appreciate it, and um, we'll catch you guys next time you come to Florida. Thanks. Bye. Keith, that means a lot. It really does, you know, to hear you having – one of your new favorite memories because of us just happen to be playing in Orlando, Florida. That that's why we do this. That's what we love. That 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 touches our hearts. It, it's hard to like. It's hard to to feel something, you know. These days, you know, it's just there's so much going on all the time. And then when you do get your emotions pulled at, your heartstrings pulled. Sometimes those are pulled in a in a weird way in a way that's disingenuous like you're watching some social media video and you you you're starting to tear up you're getting sad and you realize this is a fake video and you're just like and you just feel like ah well this is real this is you know if i could tell you y'all one thing this podcast is real uh, i i don't <laughs> you know it, you know there's this band is real everything we do is as real as we can make it and without being crappy, uh, one, of my, one of my diffusers just popped off. I got to retape that. I was like, what is that noise? Is it another raccoon? What's happening around here? So we're real. You know, we're, we're fixing this stuff up, you see, ourselves. You know, we have a team. We have a few people that help us out. But, but we're in there. We're in there making it happen. And, and, uh, and I think, you know, when, we, when I hear real memories it just reminds me why we do this it reminds me that this does make a difference you know as silly as being in a band is you know <laughs> i always think about it i laugh about it with my wife when uh when i think about how old i am 47 and i play in a band i'm in a band with a bunch of other dudes and we go and we fly around the world and we play punk rock and that is my job. And sure, there's a lot of other things that I have to do to make that stay my job as part of my job, but that's my job. My job is to work on music and 
and it's just funny because that's not very it's not very respected among adults among uh, high falutin money adults you know people that have a lot of money people that have a lot of high education people that have hoity-toity type jobs now there's i have nothing against those people i mean i have nothing against their jobs whatever their jobs may be but it's just not something that that people think is cool right um but for me i i, I feel like i've c continued to hit the lotto in life the jackpot because i get to do something that i absolutely love to do music i get to be expressive i get to be creative i get to struggle i get it's not always easy but i i get the struggles are fun and real once you're done with them like you know like when you're in them they're not always fun like when you're in a flight delay or you know your bus broke down whatever it may be right it's not fun at the time but like once you're through it you're like okay this is actually not that bad. Like, we're fine. We're going to be good. So making these memories and, and being part of your memories is is really, really what it's all about. So thank you for listening. Thank you for the, all these years. And thanks for bringing up the next generation, your children, your children's friends. Um, uh, you know, MXPX is going to remain positive. Uh, I feel I feel that, you know, we have some songs that are negative, like always, of course. But I think just in general, um, we're going to stay positive. We're going to stay looking up and looking up to the sky, smiling, letting the sunshine on our face when it's when it's out. That is <laughs> I'm from Washington State. It's not always out today. It's raining. Yesterday it was great today raining. So it happens. But you know what? We don't mind. We we learn to live with that. That's just part of life. Um, thanks for your call, Keith, man. That really means a lot. Cool. I'll see you next hey, time. Hey, Mike. This is Jarrett from Michigan. I uh, was wondering, if you guys were to start today, how would you go about launching your band? So, like, I've been listening since the second album, and obviously because of, like, how time has worked for bands, you guys have seen, like, just so many different iterations of the music business and the industry as a whole. So I was wondering, like, what would your approach be today if you guys had, had just met and had just started? So I think that'd be a fun little exercise. I think we'd all like to hear kind of what your approach would be. Thanks for taking my question. All right. Great question. And wow, you're not from Florida. Finally, somebody not from Florida. What's up, Jared? Um, this is going to be music business. Here we go. Uh, let's do a little, a little mini music business lesson now you wanted to know are you starting it what do you do when you're starting out what would i do if i was starting out now does this mean am i starting out as a brand new player like i've never played music or does that not matter is it just more about artist recognition branding name do people know who you are let's go with that let's assume i can play well okay let's just assume maybe it's my first band or my first my first thing but i'm gonna start doing music what would i do all right what would i do if i was just starting out today in the music business first thing i would do is just start interacting with people online start playing live streams whether it's myself live acoustic the full band live if you have the means to do that do live streams i would start doing live streams i would do all the normal social media stuff but as you know social media when you don't have a following is really hard to get that following so we're, what are you doing so social media is just so almost like a you should be doing that anyway and everybody's going to do that anyway so here we have number one live streaming i would do a lot of live streams all the time on different platforms and find where it seems to be clicking, where people seem to be liking what you're doing. Um, I would release new music as much as possible, put it on a schedule, start building your catalog. Now, you don't have to release too many things. Maybe you just need one, two, three songs. I wouldn't release only one song because you're going to do a lot of work for that one song. What I would do is 
work in a batch of two or three songs at a time, um, maybe even four at the most. But really, I think three is manageable. Two is is maybe the beginner level. <laughs> Actually, honestly, there's no wrong answer there. But start releasing music so that you can start gaining an audience. And then f nurture that audience. Find out who who's listening to your music. Is anybody? Is there one person over one town over? Start paying attention to that town over and start, you know, if you've got a budget for ads, I would do, I would do streaming ads to get people to go and listen to your, your songs. Um, but aside from that, I would try to do everything else organically and I wouldn't do the streaming ads right away. I would, I would do that almost at the end of everything. I would build everything organically as much as possible. Um, a few other things you could do that I might do give music lessons. If I was just starting out and I really needed to gain some, some talk, some people, some, I'm just trying to gain followers out of nothing. Being a music teacher, whatever your instrument is, you start putting out videos online. You can talk about your songs in those videos. You can have, you know, the song in the background and be playing along with it be like, this is how I did this. Um, but also just giving back, giving music lessons to people. Maybe you do, hey, I'm going to give five free music lessons to the winner of this contest. Say, contests are hard, though. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say do a contest. Um, I would say do everything as easy as possible. Make it so easy for, for, for your audience to respond to you. So if you've got a hook to hook them in, make it easy for them to go to that next step, which is clicking the link, listening to your song, clicking the link, going through to your social media to follow you, whatever that may be, make it easy. And so I have these ideas that pop into my head, like the contest thing. And I'm, I realize, no, 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 that's not a good idea. So I don't have a set strategy constantly that I like regurgitate whenever people ask me these questions. It's constantly changing. It's, it's, it really is. The landscape's changing. Technology is changing. Uh, musical tastes are changing. The way we find music changes, musical habits are listening, you know, everything is changing all the time. And whether it's a slow change, a gradual change, or something that seems to have changed overnight, always be paying attention. So doesn't mean you have to know everything about everything. That's impossible. You're never going to know. You're just, that's, you're asking to go crazy. So let's recap that. Uh, so we have live streams. Do as many live streams on all the platforms as you can. I would release a lot of new material, focus on two to three tracks at a time. Make, uh, if you can't make full music videos, you don't have the time or the technology or the budget, uh, make clips of music videos, whether it's you singing along to your song, and then that rolls us into give back to your audience. And then from there, of course, eventually play live. You should, you should have some sort of live show, but it's not necessary when you're starting out. It's, um, it's all about connecting to the internet and the greater world and finding those people that want to find you. All right. Thanks for the call. Hope you do well. I'm sure there's more that I missed in there, but honestly, hadn't really thought about it. Hey, Mike. It's uh, Matt in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, Long-time fan. Um, big fan of the new album. Much love to you guys. Great work, as always. Um, I actually, um, before uh, Find A Way Home came out, it kind of put me in the mood to kind of go through your uh, discography and just give you guys, just listen to the evolution and just take it in. I've been a fan a very long time, and it brought back some memories and actually the the first mxps album i ever actually got for myself like with my own money like in a store the hot topic i think was um one of your deeper cuts that i'm a big fan of the renaissance ep and i, I don't know i really really um <clears throat> stuck out to me just the like the blood red cover the skull it seemed like a departure for you guys and i was curious if you had any thoughts or memories from that process of um what it was like making that EP is I think that had some some banners on it like Lonesome Town, Party Two, and Here He Waits Up Streaming. And I think it's just a solid 
solid nine song record. I mean, uh, you know, um, but, uh, I don't know if there's any, any, anything about that, uh, you want to share, that'd be awesome. Any, anything out and shout out to anyone else who's a big fan of that EP. I love it. Anyway, I'm rambling a bit. Big fan. Love what you guys do. Hoping to catch you live sometime, but, uh, I know it's not easy to get out east much. And I know you guys were just out here, but I wasn't able to make it, but. All the best to you. Keep it up. Take care. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, we we've been to Baltimore, but it's been a little while, so we'll we'll make it back. I'm sure. Uh, the Renaissance EP. Let's talk about it. That's the first recording that we released that was recorded at the clubhouse, which was my first studio. Not just my studio. It was the it was MXPX's studio, but it was at my parents' house, and it was in the garage. And we just, you know we built it and. We had um, these local guys, local friends of ours, come and frame it, punker, skater dudes, um, Frank Madden and company. And so, like, yeah, it was, it was just this DIY project. We put together this first class, uh, sorry, this, uh, this the clubhouse studios, and then we started recording and demoing, and we recorded the Renaissance EP. I don't know. We just want, you know, we were just demoing, and we were like, this could be, we could, you know, do something with this. Can we maybe here's the thing we were signed to a&m records at the time and we had wanted to do something with fat records talking to fat mike about it and we're like well i guess we could ask a&m if they'll let us just re release a seven inch or something like that so we asked if we could you know we we're between records it was oh I, I guess it was after it was after slowly going the way of the buffalo before Maybe it was after the ever passing moment before, before everything and after. Sorry, <laughs> um, trying to think. Yeah, I think it was in there. It was like two thousand three, two thousand ish, two thousand one, somewhere in there. And we asked them, "Can we do a seven inch, maybe an EP on this indie record label, Fat Records, just in between records?" And they're like. Sure. Like, no big deal. All right. Uh, and you guys don't own any of it? Nope. We're good. Cool. So that was probably one of the coolest things that Universal actually did do for us was, at the time, they were A&M Records. But, uh, so we got to do a record on Fat Records, and we recorded the Renaissance EP. Told Mike, all right, we're going to do this record. We're doing it ourselves. <laughs> He probably wasn't thrilled about that. I mean, we didn't have a producer or anything. We just, I mixed it myself. That's how, that's how amateur this whole operation was. And it was my first time really doing anything like that. So that's why it sounds like it does. Um, there's no like knowledge of like, oh, this is how you mix a record or this or that. Like I just literally put up the faders and was like, does it sound kind of like it should? I guess. All right, cool. Uh, which, of course, it didn't sound like it really should. But a lot of people really like the sound of that record. I don't hate it, obviously. I mean, I was like, all right, it's good, it's good enough. Ah, <laughs> oh, geez. It's just, it's funny to think back. You know, it's like, um, I was like thinking about when you, you know, the first time you pooped your pants or something. I don't know. But um, when Fat Mike got the record, when he got the, 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 the mixes, he was like, wow, I was expecting I was expecting you guys to send really bad songs. These are actually really good. So he was surprised that we didn't just give him crap because it wasn't a real release. It was a, an EP and not an LP. But we didn't really think of it that way. We honestly were just like, these are the next songs we wrote. Why would we give you crappy songs? <laughs> we're so naive like that. Like, why would people do that? You know, but... Um, Oh, oh, children. Oh, children. All right. That's that's my memories from Renaissance EP. It was fun. And, you know, we were just kind of learning how to do it. Still are still learning. All right. Let's let's get to the next one. Hey, Mike, it's Gabe. I called earlier about um, Odessa, Texas. Yeah, it was. It was at a place called Dos Amigos. And you were with Chiodos. And it was it was rad, but also I was gonna tell you I got tickets for the Bremerton show on the twenty eighth. Me and my wife Jessica and Amanda and Jen are going. Hopefully they go. 
we could still looking for tickets for those two, but I had a question. If, uh, what was your favorite place to play out of all your, your concerts in your life? Mm. What's your favorite venue? And also, um, the South Down to San Antonio album, Heard That Sound, is amazing. The vibe that I get, and it, it's my favorite song on that album. So just wanted to say what's up. Keep rocking. Later. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks for calling back. Dos Amigos. That was the place. That was the place. And Chiodos. I was right. Okay, I remember that. It was an outdoor venue and just a wild place like we're just out in the middle of nowhere in texas i mean we were in the city but you get what it was the city itself is in the middle of nowhere like there's nothing around city when you fly into there um because i've flown in i've flown in for some reason i don't remember not that show i've flown in separately though and it's just like there's nothing there and you're just like coming in there's a street or street two it's pretty wild um but there's so much rich history to East Texas and sorry, West Texas. And, you know, those, those, those old Texas towns, man, they're, they're, um, that's Americana. That's living and breathing, barely breathing, but it's just a far, it's a far ride out there. It really is. No wonder those buses broke down. You know, it's just too far for anybody out there to go. But my favorite venue in the world in history wow that's that's rough that's that's i don't i mean i don't know if my answer is going to be my real answer because i i can't be comprehensive i guess um let me think uh my favorite venue let's try to narrow it down to the u.s first what would be my favorite venue in the u.s the show box in some ways because it's it's home the admiral theater here in Bremerton, Washington. Also one of my favorite venues because it's so close to home. It's got all the things that bands need. We've got great dressing rooms, bathrooms, backstage, comfort, space. Uh, the staff is awesome. Stage is great. Uh, now, stage-wise, show-wise, is it my favorite venue? Probably not. Um, I liked Palladium stage-wise. Loved the Palladium. Had a great time playing there. Um, but what is the favorite venue? It, you Back in the day, it used to be Janice Landing because it was just like a different, it was so different, you know? Um, there was another place in, 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 oh, not, not, Mer not Richmond, Maryland. No, maybe it was Richmond. It was somewhere in Maryland. Um, there was a venue there still is a venue. It still is around and it has like a hot tub. And, um, that used to be kind of like one of our favorites just because it was so fun to play because of the, the extra facilities they had. But, um, actually I don't think I ever got in the hot tub. It was always just like, I, there's no way I'm getting in that dude soup. So, um, let me say, let me say, uh, I used to really enjoy playing the House of Blues Hollywood, even though half the time I felt like we wouldn't have a good show, like something would break, like technically an amp would break or the monitor would break or something like that would happen. Um, I really liked, I really liked the observatory San Diego down in San Diego because San Diego is just so fun. Um, I know that it's probably too small and we won't play there again, but maybe we'll see. Uh, probably like Soma. I remember Soma down in San Diego. Um, that's not one of my favorite venues, but I do, you know, I do like San Diego. Um, where else? Where else? Tramps used to be one of my favorite places to play. Tramps in, in New York, but it's gone. It's gone now. Um, hmm. The Metro, Chicago. You guys remember the Metro? MXPX should play there again. Maybe someday. Um, worldwide. Where are my favorite venues worldwide? See, venues, it's like... I don't really... Th the venues are so similar. 
most of them. Uh, I'm going to say one of the best places to play is Red Rocks in Denver. I know that's U.S. again, but Red Rocks in Denver, Colorado is beautiful. It's beautiful. Played there. Um, it's almost like a bucket list item if you're a musician to, to play there. Anyway, um, I think we've played there a couple times. Um, but for the most part, venues like that don't do it for me. Like venues like that, meaning, uh, amphitheaters, another great amphitheater speaking of is the gorge in Washington state, beautiful backdrop, beautiful setting. But you know, there's other things that I don't like about it. The drive, it's so far away. The, the parking situation, you know, like there's, there's always something you can find to complain about, but that, that venue is awesome. We've played there a lot over the years. I've seen a lot of shows there and will continue to, I hope. Uh, I think Willie Nelson's coming this summer. Might try to go. Um, actually, I might be gone. I might be out of town. Anyway, life is good. Venues. Um, this is the most I really thought about individual venues in a while, but um, let's just let's just say the winner right now is... Bremerton, Washington's very own The Admiral Theater. Boom. Is that not fair? Probably not fair, but I'm sticking with it. All right. Um, somewhere in Brazil is pretty cool, too. Brazil, Japan, Australia. There's a lot of great places. All right. Europe, UK. I don't know the venues, though. The Underground, pretty fun punk venue. <laughs> Down in Camden Underground. Uh, I like the underground because of where it is, the location. It's a great spot to just walk around, people watch, get some food, shop for a leather wallet, whatever, whatever you might need. Cool spot. A hat, maybe a new hat, a, scar a scarf. All right, let's get to a couple more, and, um, and you can go about your day or night. All right. Hey. This message is for Mike Herrera. This is Joey Three Toes. I don't know too much about uh, poppy punk, whatever <laughs> you've been playing. Yeah. I'm into hardcore. Hardcore. The hardcore life. Hardcore is in the front line, Ooh. baby. If you were in the hardcore life, you fold faster than Superman on laundry day. Or whatever kind of superhero you're into. I don't know. You're the nerds, not me. If you need to talk about harder bands, like, for example, Madball. They live it every day. So I've been working out. Listening to hardcore, I got a new washboard stomach, and the first head I'm gonna crack on it's yours, my Carrera. So keep podcasting, and I'll keep calling you. And listen to Bad Madball. <laughs> Gotta love it. All right, we'll play a second here. So you want you want me to play more hardcore, talk about more hardcore bands, play more hardcore. I get you. I get you. We will. You can do it right now. We're going to start right now. In fact, you know, Lou from Sick of It All was on this podcast a while back. I've had a couple other hardcore musicians and, and players on. Um, I love hardcore, but I will admit, I know the poppy punk a little bit better. I know a little bit more of that, <laughs> even though I didn't even know that face-to-face -face song. But, uh, <clears throat> hey, I'm just trying to please. How long is this Mad Boss on? Is it ever going to start? <laughs> there it is. Sounds good. Yeah, so obviously I can't play that right now. But yes, I'm going to I'm going to throw on some more Mad Ball. I've of I've, uh, I've always respected the band. Never really got too into their songs, but um 
there's a bunch of other bands that I've gotten into, Gorilla Biscuits, H2O, and, you know, Hatebreed. And, and, and so, like, Youth of Today, stuff like that. So I just kind of missed out on, on Madball. But you know what? Me and my washboard stomach, we're going to be listening to some Madball this week. All right? All right. Joey Three Toes, thanks for the call. I appreciate you. Yo, Mike Jackson here from Central Florida. We uh, were at the Orlando House of Blues show last month, and it was incredible. And I've been seeing you guys play. The first time I saw you, I think, was in 2003 on the Honda Civic Tour with Good Charlotte and New Found Glory. So I've seen you many, many times over the years. Man, that show was outrageous. The energy, the set list, the... The feedback, I feel like, coming from the crowd, it, it was very, very special. It's a unique uh, just just experience. Like, they're all have been just, just so special in my favorite shows. But, man, I uh, I just wanted to say, man, Orlando was awesome. And uh, my question for you is this. I just got done reading uh, the Foo Fighters, Dave Grohl biography, and then I also just got done reading the No Effects, uh, Hepatitis Bat, a book that they wrote and it was really interesting. I don't know if you've checked it out, but it's Hefe and Melvin and um, Mike and Eric all uh, taking turns writing a chapter. And it was just really cool just, just learning some history, hearing some stories and some inside stuff. So uh, I know y'all released the, the picture book recently, but have you guys talked about uh, possibly writing a book together and maybe even following the same format of you writing a chapter, Tom and Yuri and it was cool also, too, hearing the different perspectives on the same story. So, cheers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up? Thanks for the call, Michael Jackson. How you doing? Big fan. I'm sure you get that a lot, so I apologize. Um, yeah, I haven't read the Foo Fighters book. I've read a little bit of the No Effects book. And hadn't really thought about, oh, I should do this myself. Um, of course, over the years, we've thought about yeah, maybe we should write a book. Maybe we should, write, but it's just I don't know. We we feel like we're still in the middle of everything. We're not done yet, and so to write a book now is to have to write another one eventually. Now I don't know if I'll ever write a book. I maybe Chat G, GPT will write a book for me. <laughs> I'm not going to do that, but that's the thing. Is like if I write a book now there's the ending ain't over so what do i how do i end it do i leave it open-ended it feels unsatisfying it feels like it's not right for me yet that being said hey anybody should write a book at any whenever they want to and so no effects Foo fighters they're not done well no effects is done now but at the time they weren't done um but maybe that was part of their plan maybe they're like okay let's write a book let's do a world tour uh and we can be done you know let's let's uh whatever let's make three albums a, a half album a full album and a double album something like that and and so whatever whatever their reasoning being it is what it is um now i assume people on this podcast would probably be into an mxpx book and i think we probably should at least think about it, but should it be something that is released now when we're, I mean, we just released a new album last year, late last year, later last year, S still on that. And then, you know, we might, we're going to release new songs at some point again, you know, and then we may probably put out another record eventually, like eventually not too long not as long as we waited last time that's that's my goal is to not wait as long as the last one of course we had a whole pandemic and all that and 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 whatever but yeah it's it's um anyway i'm just i'm getting lost in my thoughts about the pandemic and about the, the album and so book wise i really feel i really feel like eventually we could do that and 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 getting all our stories together would be fun and a, half the time i ask tom or yuri i'll be like hey do you remember this and they, they'll be like not at all other things 
I don't remember that they remember. So like we, we both kind of both take turns being the one with the memory. I don't know. All right. Great idea. Maybe it'll happen someday. Um, we're going to need a pretty good ghostwriter though. We're going to need somebody to really spruce up these stories, make them sound fun, make them sound interesting, make them uh, salacious a little bit, you know. So, yeah, get at me. All right. Thanks for the call, Mike. Appreciate it. Let's get to one more, one more voicemail, and then we will we'll say goodbye for the week. Hey, Mike. This is Adam from Indiana. But hey, I was kind of touching base, just loving the new album so much, Find a Way Home, so good. I just kind of have maybe kind of a general question about it, as far as like the process of the writing. It's, I kind of, I was like into your band just for a long time, and like PX, I mean, just since I had 2000, saw you guys at Cornerstone, one of my first concerts, just followed you guys for the longest time, loved everything. And then I kind of got out of pop punk in general, uh, I don't know, like, I remember Secret Weapon loved it, and for whatever reason, just kind of got out of the scene, just hadn't really paid much attention, and kind of got into some other genres of music more, and then I caught wind of your latest album, and it's just like, it just pulled me right back in, and, I, and you know, I, I like the albums between as well, but there's just something about this one that just seems like a major step up, like, in songwriting quality and, and everything, like, I don't know if you could trace it back. Is there like something personally that happened or like, did you do something differently like in the creation of this album? Or I don't know. It just feels like the songs are so incredibly tight, so well-constructed, so catchy. Like my wife is a casual fan. Like she heard it and like just loved it, obsessed. And it kind of caused her to go back and reassess a lot of you guys' previous albums and like them even more. And like, my little girl, she's four, seemed to be five. Absolutely loves the album. And it, I don't know, it's just like it's such a special thing to experience. And yeah, just, you know, if you could, you know, I don't know, expand on the process, maybe talk about that a little bit. And uh, yeah, there's, no one else in the scene has really been able to kind of reach, I think, that level. Like, you know, this is like a late career album for you guys, band. I mean, it's something that, it was pretty rare to hear a band firing all cylinders like that this late in the game. So, yeah, I want to touch base, talk about that for a bit. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate it, man. It means a lot that you and your whole family are digging the new record. I mean, that's that's all bands ever want is, is for fans to love the new album. Um, the process it w was a little different from our previous stuff. So we're always trying to learn. We're always going... We're always going, okay, what can we do next to make it a little better or tweak it or, you know, whatever. And and without going so far past what we just did, because then it's like you get this weird future shock or this equivalent of future shock, I guess it could be. It's not necessarily future shock. It's some sort of like juxtaposition of, okay, I was listening to this and now I'm listening to a new band. What is this? So we try not to go crazy like that, but we, you know, with poking at you to teenage politics, it's like that jumps quite a bit. Teenage politics to life in general. Wow. Another huge jump, uh, life in general to slowly going the way of the Buffalo, totally different sound, different style, even though it's the same band, you're like, okay, something changed. The tone is different. Um, the feel is different. And, and I feel like it was just continued, you know, with, with the ever passing moment changed again, you know, with before everything and after it changed again, it got super slick, poppy, but, uh, I feel like part of it is that part of it is just the progression that we go through. So when we got to self-titled, we really wanted to strip down and have an album that is what you see is what you get. There is nothing on this record that we can't do live. Now, with Find A Way Home, production-wise, we decided, okay, we're not going to go crazy on that. We're going we're gonna to make, make it a little bit more like a traditional album, whereas there are a few things on the album that we can't pull off live because it's like an extra hand or an extra part. That is a little bit different from, from self-titled, but it's not different from our older records. Our older records are pretty much all like that, um, made like a traditional album. 
Um, can't really count Poconetcha. I mean, it's made like a traditional album, but not really. I mean, I didn't, we didn't even do any overdubs on the vocals. So it's just like one pass through unless I screwed up. Uh, then I would redo it one pass through and we kept that. So always getting better. Uh, when Ryan Furlot came to record, he, he produced the record and he's from Portland. I was like, okay, let's, and I might do this even more so on the next one. Let's not completely tweak all the drums and make everything too perfect, which they are already pretty perfect. Like when Yuri plays, he's playing perfectly. And then he's like, I don't know about that part, guys. Maybe I need to redo that. And we're like, wait, what are you talking about? It's perfect. So that's Yuri. And that's, <laughs> so when, 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 you know, producers take Yuri's drums and they make, they make them even more perfect, it could sound very robotic. Um, so we tried not to do that. And, and we actually undid some, a couple songs that were too perfect sounding. We made them less perfect. So when you're saying it sounds all tight, it, it is, is really tight. But I also feel like it's not, tight isn't the only thing you want because anybody could basically fake it. You know, you could, there's a thing called quanta, quanta, quantization or quantization. I'm not sure exactly which, which word, but it's, I think it's quantization. Quantizing is when you're playing like a piano, a piano part, ding, 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 ding. Okay. So there's your part. And if you play it like ding, 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 ding. Ding, ding. Okay, you played it terribly, right? Quantizing, and you can give it the amount of percentage you want it to quantize to the beat. But quantize will take those beats and make them perfect. They'll like elongate one that's too short, and it'll shorten one that's too long. It'll make a, a quiet note louder. It'll make a loud note quieter. And that's, you're basically... It's taking what it thinks you probably were meant to be doing, and it makes it that. Now, this is like kind of like arti artificial intelligence, but it's been around a while, and and you're kind of telling telling it what the perimeters are and what it should kind of do, but that's quantizing, and that's that's something that you know. And so, so you might be like working in your DAW, your digital audio workshop, whatever, computer, right? Your, your computer session where you're recording in Pro Tools. I use Pro Tools, but um, Pro Tools or Logic or something like that. You know, when you're quantizing, you can add a thing called Swing where it adds, or, or sometimes some of the plugins or programs will make it like humanize. And you click that and you can make the percentage go up to like, you know, 100%. Well, it's 100 human. Why even have it? But uh, that'll make the robotic vibes to when you fix stuff, it'll give it a more human swing. So it'll like stay off the beat a little bit. Cause there are, like I was saying, you can be too perfect. So it's almost like taking a sleeping pill to fall asleep, drinking coffee, taking Adderall to wake up and be awake, drinking coffee and then going, well, now I can't sleep. I need to take a sleeping pill take a sleeping pill, go to sleep. So it's just, I mean, and the best bet for us is doing it analog, doing it in, in real life, as you call it, as the kids say, IRL. So um, <laughs> it's funny, you know, we have all this technology and sometimes the best way to get something done is just to do it for real, do it in analog. All right. Great, great uh, episode this week. Appreciate all your calls. If you want to call in yourself, leave me a voicemail. Give me a topic. Give me an idea. Give me a question. Whatever it is, I'd love to talk about it. The number is 360-830-6660. Go check out mxpeaks.com. We got new merch up there. Um, <coughs> we'll have new merch for the summer coming. Uh, of course, MXPX is playing the 28th and 29th in Bremerton, Washington. It's sold out. Thank you. I hope some of you that are looking for tickets can still find those. Um, we do our best not to sell a bunch of scalp tickets to scalpers. So it's a little harder to find our tickets when it sells out. Keep that in mind, people. Um, 
but I appreciate you. Thank you so much for buying those tickets. Uh, MXPX.com. Please listen to MXPX on whatever platform you listen to. Add our new album, Find a Way Home. Add our self-titled album if you don't already have that. It's got Let's Ride on it. It's got all of it. Rolling Strong, Friday Tonight, some of those favorites. Um, all right, MXPX Challenge. Make sure you listen to MXPX every day. <laughs> all right, we're moving into June. By the time I see you next week, it will be June. Um, so I hope hope you're doing well. Shout out to Bob McKnight, producing the podcast, making it happen every week. Appreciate you, bud. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>